Well, the main tradition is speaking Russian because my parents spoke Russian at home and it was a kind thing of them to do because they lost their, they couldn't gain as much English as they could if they had a kid running around, you know, yelling about the Flintstones in English. So, uh, but that helped me retain my Russian. And so it's good for, you know, so that's my main tradition is speaking to them in Russian and just, the culinary traditions are, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, when I discovered food that wasn't Russian, that was a wonderful moment in my life. But I still like some stuff. I love um, uh, dishes that are crazy sounding to Americans, like silotka potsrubi, which is um, herring under the coat, under the overcoat, which is basically herring just smothered with beets and mayonnaise and stuff like that. Uh, it's a great thing to drink vodka with, which I guess is another tradition. You know, rampant alcoholism is, is another Russian tradition too, that I'm proud of. Yeah. It's tough, you know, I mean, he has, he, he has uh, two heritages, you know, Russian and, and Korean, um, which are both to pass on. I don't know, because in New York, he'll just be taught Mandarin in school. So, you know, I, I'd love to come back to Russia and visit Russia and visit Korea with him as well. So, but, you know, in Russia, you're sort of steered to, in direction by your parents, but America is much more loosey-goosey about that, and I think it's, I want to have some role, obviously, in setting the pace for him, but I also want him to develop his own interests. I want to see what he likes and what he's interested in. And if he wants to, you know, join McKinsey and move to Russia and become a consultant, what can I do? You know, it's, uh, that'll happen. Uh, so I'm, I'm very open-minded. I don't want to be the Luddite who, you know, just constantly complains about things, but, you know, it's so different when you check into a hotel room and the first thing you're thinking of is where can I plug in my phone, you know, instead of I should just plop on the bed and either fall asleep or open up a book, but you're just like sort of scanning the room for outlets and, and my kid and others won't even think twice about that or whatever they have to do. It's, it's just, it's different. It, it, my only problem is that it moves so fast. There was a time when it felt a lot slower. The innovation certainly felt a lot slower. The 80s was, you know. But now we're just doing it so fast that I'm not sure what level of human I am anymore, you know, and which part of me is the cyborg. It's a tough call, you know. Um, the canary in the coal mine for a while has been poetry, which endures. You don't usually get, you know, nice several hundred crowd people showing up. Sometimes you do, you know, if it's an amazing poet, but it's tough, you know, it's tough and, and it's tough to get people to concentrate for that long because this is, it demands something. The, the, the reward is so great, but the, you know, the startup cost, as you would say in San Francisco, is, is, is fairly high for people whose lives are already dissected a million different ways by their electronic devices. But the, the, the reward is so great, it's, it's a sense of empathy you can't get anywhere else. It's the idea that you can enter into the consciousness of another human being. That's what our book is. It's a technology that outpaces anything Apple or Google could ever produce, you know. And uh, so I do hope it endures. <laughs>